how did we move then from the Jewish prophet Jesus, the unique prophet, uh, supernaturally begotten, to a Gentile God? This is the fundamental question which everybody who's interested in the Bible must tackle. The answer is quite clear. If we look at the extensive writings of Justin Martyr, we've moved into a different ballgame altogether. We've shifted base. We have Justin arguing with a trifo, a Jew, to the effect that the Messiah pre-existed as some sort of begotten son, not eternally begotten, that comes later with the Rijan, but existing as a being, consciously, as a second God, not Trinity exactly. But once you move the birth certificate of Jesus back behind that time and create an extra life, you append an angel life and eventually a God the Son life to this innocent story of Luke and Matthew, you wreck the whole thing. That's why the best commentators have pointed out, and I'm quoting Luce here, a, pa a pupil of Harnack, Luce, Professor Luce, a distinguished pupil of Harnack, the great historian, and Luce says that it was Justin Martyr who produced the Verkehrung of the faith, that's a good German word, rather old German word, perversion, perversion of the faith. He wrecks the faith by not believing Matthew and Luke as they stand. Would you believe it that Justin Martyr gets to Luke 135 and instead of reading it as obviously any ordinary person would, that the Son is coming into existence by miracle, Justin Martyr is saying, no, the Son is producing his own miracle. The Son is invading Mary. This is really a fearful paganism. And from there things went, went from bad to worse. They then turned into ultimately the God, the Son. All of that's unnecessary. All we do is read John 1 as Professor... Brown Fuller said so nicely, to read John 1.1 1, 1, as though it says, in the beginning was the Son, is patently wrong. It doesn't say that. It says, in the beginning was the Word, little w, not a capital W person. Well, there are 50 translations which don't put a capital, or don't put the word him, but put the word it, either one of the two. They either take the capital off, or they talk about it, the word, not him, the word. Now, that word finally becomes a human being in John 1.14. That's very clear. God expresses himself in a Son uniquely. The importance of this subject, of course, is to define Jesus correctly. He's the Messiah. The Messiah as an angel pre-existing is foreign to the whole of the Old Testament. It just isn't there. The angel of the Lord is clearly not the Messiah. Hebrews 1 expressly says that God never said to an angel at any time, under any circumstances whatsoever, he never said, you're my son today, I've begotten you. That ought to any unprejudiced reader, at the most elementary level, tell us that Jesus could not be an angel. Once you have him pre-existing, you're talking about an angel, whether it's Michael or not. When you speak to Jehovah's Witnesses at your door, try it. They're very confused in this area. They just don't know how to deal with that. Again, I repeat, Hebrews is intent upon killing the idea that Jesus, the Messiah, could be an angel at any point. We ought really to take that text seriously. That clears the air then. We now know that Jesus doesn't pre-exist himself. The whole idea is fearfully complex. Does it make any difference? Well, of course. You're supposed to identify Jesus for who he really is. He's the Messiah of Israel. He's the Son of God with Luke 135. That should be enough to convince everybody. Go away, sit down, and get on with life. This is easy. Luke 135. For that reason, precisely, the angel said to Mary, who believed it, and most people don't, that the Son of God is precisely the Son of God because of the miracle wrought in Mary. What a beautiful foundation text to build our unity upon.